Good morning. On behalf of the College of Continuing and Professional Studies and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Minnesota, also known as Ali, welcome to our 2022 sampler. My name is Kate Schaefers, and I'm director of Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Minnesota, and I will be your host this morning. Let me start with our land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It's important to acknowledge the people on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. So a little bit about Ali. Ali is a dynamic member-based learning organization that provides courses, events, special interest groups, and volunteer opportunities designed specifically for people over the age of 50. For today's sampler, we have about 860 people registered. My thanks to all of you for giving us this opportunity to showcase Ali's rich and vibrant learning community. And it will gonna give you a taste of three of our courses that will be offered this fall. If you're a current or renewing Ali member, thank you for your continued support and participation. And if you're new to Ali, welcome to this remarkable community. We look forward to getting to know you. Uh, just a point that it's important for you to know is that registration for our fall courses starts next week. And so um, if you'd like to learn more to start or renew your membership or download a course guide, please go to our website at ali, that's O-L-L-I dot U-M-N dot E-D-U. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a few housekeeping tips that will help make your experience the best it can be. We're hosting this program via Zoom, and you should find your Zoom controls either at the bottom of your screen or at the top, although it might be hidden until you move your cursor or touch your screen. Your microphone will remain off during this webinar, and if you need to request help or technical assistance, please use the chat function, which again, you'll find at the bottom of your screen or at the top. The chat, I, chat icon is typically um, at the bottom and you may need to be moving your cursor to access it. While today's presenters won't be answering questions, we will be using the Q&A box for you to submit general questions about Ali. And I encourage you to submit questions throughout the event and our staff will respond to you directly and or will answer your questions live at the end of the session. And also if you find it helpful, the live transcript function can be turned on or off. This morning's event runs for about an hour and a half. And today we're gonna to hear from two of our members who are also volunteers with Ali, and we'll also feature our three instructors. So we've got a great session planned for you today. So let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce our Ali Advisory Board Chair, Nancy Allen. In addition to her role as Chair of the Advisory Board, Nancy has been an active Ali member since 2014. She frequently volunteers as a course assistant. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Allen. Welcome, Nancy. Hello, Kate, and good morning to everybody. It is so nice to be with you today. And I am honored to be the chair of the OLLI board, which I have been for the last two years. And um, it is, again, my pleasure to welcome all of you to our sampler session. We, have found, we started this last year and it's been a great, great success. Um, let's see, can you, okay, there we go. I wanna talk a little bit about our Ollie and where is Ollie? And we are the only one in Minnesota. We have 125 uh, institutes in 50 states, including DC. We have, uh, we are on the campus of 97 public and 28 private colleges and universities. Um, okay. And as you can see on this screen, we are on the campus of the University of Minnesota. We are currently hosting classes both on Zoom and at the campus in St. Paul. Um, so we have classes that are held in person and online. And we have uh, the University of Minnesota is our one of our partners and uh, we are so grateful to have them as part of our community. Ali is served and supported by, we are all volunteer advisory board 
And of course, Ali is a membership-based organization with lots of opportunities to get involved. We have, um, next slide, please. We're, yeah. We have lots of, uh, hopefully we're gonna get more active life, uh, social engagement opportunities to be in person. We all know that we've been through the pandemic and we've done a lot of things on Zoom, but now it's time for us to get in person. And we have a lot of social engagements. And of course, Ali is uh, dedicated to the continuous active lifelong learning that we all so enjoy. And it gives us a purpose. And for many of us, it's the joy of the second half of our lives. So we are a curious bunch. We have lots of non-credit courses, I hope. Many of you will receive the current catalog or you may certainly ask for one. But some of the classes, as you can see here on the screen, we have a diversity of classes from music to literature, to history, to genealogy. Um, most of the time I have a terrible time trying to figure out how many courses I'm gonna be able to take. But um, of course you can take as many as you wish. So please look at the catalog or ask for it and or it's online and sign up for as many classes as you can. We have, okay. Um, most of the um, courses we have on Zoom, many of them are in person. Um, we offer training for Zoom, so do not feel at all intimidated about joining us for classes on Zoom. We'll certainly help you. We have course assistants that help and of course um, other members will be able to help you but please do not let classes on zoom be a deterrent for you to joining ollie and again at least half of our classes now are going to be uh, not only on campus but all over the twin cities in communities or in churches or in um, halls or they're all over the place so um, we also have what we call um, SIG leaders, and those are people who are in charge of our SIG classes uh, or courses such as uh, uh, Scrabble or Bananagrams, or um, there's some book groups that we meet. Um, so they're not just all, they're more informal. Um, you want to put up another slide? There we go. Special interest groups, those were the six. And um, they're created by members for members and they're a wonderful social and cultural opportunity. Um, we meet regularly. Um, uh, there's dozens of themes, as you can see. There's jazz, memoir writing, storytelling, theater going, St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, and numerous book, book clubs. Um, so uh, that's a wonderful opportunity for you to meet in smaller groups and they're informal. Uh, and it says my SIG group, book group meets for discussions and is so stimulating. So there are lots and lots of fun. Uh, we have all sorts of classes. So SIGs are part of OLLI and there are lots and lots and lots of wonderful opportunities. We ask members to please participate as volunteers as well. You can lead a course. You can become a course assistant, um, manage a SIG group, serve on the advisory board, uh, help host events, or volunteer for standing uh, committee. We have lots of opportunities for you. So we welcome you to Ali, and we hope that you will enjoy today's um, sampler. And I look forward to meeting many of you and seeing you in class. Um, so please enjoy this morning. And it's, as again, it's a social event. We uh, have online social gatherings. We have picnics that are coming up and we have a lot more. So meet interesting people, make new friends. This is what Ali is all about. I know many of you have missed seeing each other because of the pandemic, but we really hope to get together more and we have some gatherings and meetings up 
coming up soon. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. Nancy, thank you so much for that. And I'd like to now introduce you to Laura Peterson. So Laura is one of our newer members. Laura joined during the pandemic and she's been with us since 2020. And she's here to tell you a little bit about her personal experience of being part of this learning community. Laura, thanks for being here. And Grayson, you can take the screen down um, where we won't be using a PowerPoint for this part. Thank you, Kate. Um, I won't take more than a few minutes of your time because I know you are really here for these wonderful sampler classes, but I just wanted to let you know what Ali has meant to me for the last few years. Um, so I love Ali, obviously, or I wouldn't be here talking to you. And I suspect that many of you who are here today are like me and that you enjoy learning. Um, my own love of learning goes way back. I majored in Chinese history in college. <clears throat> and then I went on to nursing school and then I went on to law school. And I honestly loved all of it. Um, but then also like many of you, the demands of a career and raising a family took over the next 30 or so years of my life. But then retirement came and the world opened up again for me. Um, I learned about Ali from Lonnie Screntner, who is a retired history teacher, and she regularly teaches classes for Ollie. So I decided to check it out in the fall of 2020. Um, and let me tell you, there was no turning back after that moment. I did initially just sign up for four classes, just. I took, um, well, I nestled into my hammock that fall with my laptop, and I took uh, classes on the politics of poverty, reading Jane Eyre, research on police killings, and the Supreme Court. So a completely diverse group of courses. And I just couldn't get enough. Ali really provided me with structure and frankly joy during the pandemic. Um, it ignited my thirst to learn more. To the point that at one moment in Ali, I was actually taking 13 classes at once. <clears throat> which was a bit much, but not to discourage you, go for it. Um, I have taken classes on art at MIA. You can go to the art museum and other museums virtually through Ali. Weapons of mass destruction, um, insects with real insects brought into the class, uh, Chinese history, immunology, the food stamp program, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, Africa, India, TED Talks, Charles Dickens, and more. Um, as Nancy mentioned, all of the classes were offered through Zoom at that time, but Ali is now offering sort of a hybrid model so that you can do whichever type of learning suits you best, in person or through Zoom or both. There's also, as Nancy mentioned, lots of opportunities to give back. I have found myself uh, over these past two years uh, being a course assistant, which was fun. I've filled in as a convener for the At The U series. Um, I've helped screen graduate students for the Ali Scholars Program, which was wonderful. I love talking to the graduate students about their coursework and the subject matter that they're passionate about. And I became a peer mentor to Ali presenters for their first Zoom classes to make sure they were comfortable with the technology. And I have met wonderful, interesting people. Classes are great, there are no tests, there is no homework, they are time limited. Um, and I think you'll find that Ali members truly live that saying, curiosity never retires. They are people just like you. They're interested in learning, they're interested in meeting people and interested in growing. So check out the fall 2022 catalog. There are 73 courses there from soup to nuts. There's absolutely gonna be something there that you will love and um, take as many classes as you want. And you'll enjoy all of them. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much for that. And also thank you for helping to uh, talk a little bit about the range of the courses we have, because you're right. I mean, we there's something for everyone and it is just tremendously interesting to be able to explore things maybe that are 
of interest to you, but also maybe to stretch out of areas where you've learned before and just try to take some new things. And my guess is that bug class was probably one of those new ones. <laughs> um, and I, I, that was incredibly popular and people were quite surprised at how much they loved it. So um, now I'd like to introduce you to our three course leaders that we have today. And we're gonna give you a glimpse of some of the courses that we're offering. Um, and as Laura said, you know, we have a variety of courses. Um, our first lecture, I think, is a good example of a course that's based on history, but also has tremendous relevance for what's going on today. Um, Professor Ted Farmer is going to speak to us on China and the Cold War. Uh, Ted is a Harvard graduate a professor emeritus of history and global studies from the University of Minnesota, and he's been a frequent Ali instructor. His popular and engaging courses provide context for today's issues while bringing history to life. Now, we also have some of our courses that are focused more on personal development, and we know that, you know, this second half of life um, is different from the first half of life, and so sometimes we need to really be thinking about and being purposeful about planning around that, and our second lecture is called Is a Portfolio Life in Your Future? And our speaker is George Dow. George spent his career coaching executives as they transitioned into new careers and lives. And his insights are drawn from his experiences working with thousands of people who have navigated new opportunities and challenges in the workplace as well as beyond. And before starting his own consulting business, George was vice president of Wright Management and a senior lecturer at Carlson School of Management. And then we also, some of our courses come directly from research. And so we have a, a, a mini lecture today um, that is applying music in telehealth. And Ye Wu is our presenter. And Wu is a PhD student in rehabilitation science at the University of Minnesota Medical School. She's a board certified music therapist. She's taught for Ali over the past several years through our Ali Scholars Program. Um, which Laura had mentioned. She was part of the selection committee with that. So the scholars program is we bring in graduate students, typically advanced graduate students, to come talk to us about their research and help us better understand um, what's cutting edge out there. And also for the graduate students to have them um, learn how to communicate what they do in their work to a population that's a very engaged group of, of lay people who are not necessarily in that field. Um, Wu is a musician. She teaches at McPhail Center for Music, and she's worked in music therapy in, with individuals across a variety of medical conditions and cultural backgrounds. So we're going to start with Ted's lecture, and I will want to note with you, um, because Ted is traveling, we pre-recorded his lecture to make sure that we had high quality presentation. So his is a pre-recorded lecture. So Grayson, let's go ahead and start with Ted's lecture. Um, hi, my name is Ted Farmer, and I teach uh, Ali courses and mostly on China. And I've been asked to say a few words, and I thought um, maybe I'd say something about the Taiwan question because it's related to China and it's been in the news uh, lately. Um, so, what is the Taiwan question? Um, the Taiwan question is one of the most dangerous. Um, issues facing the United States today. It's the one thing that could cause a, um, easily, easily cause a war between China and the United States. Um, at a news conference in May, uh, President Biden was asked if um, Taiwan were threatened by mainland China, would the United States um, respond uh, to defend Taiwan? And Biden said, yes. <laughs> and uh, so the White House had to walk this back because this is a, this is a violation of the, um, the studied ambiguity of American policy. We're supposed to not say yes, not say no, but imply that we would be concerned about defending Taiwan. So he, he got that wrong. He's, he's made this mistake three times. So its question is, is that a mistake or not? Um, anyway, the, the Chinese were outraged, and uh, um, <clears throat> just a couple of days ago, um, Xi Jinping and Biden had a two-hour conversation. This is a regular sort of get in touch with your adversaries kind of conversation, and, um, and Xi Jinping made a point of warning Biden about Taiwan. 
it's a big issue uh, for Chinese, uh, you know, uh, national pride. Uh, they consider Taiwan a province of China, and uh, they want it back. And uh, Xi Jinping has Xi Jinping has promised to get it back. Um, <clears throat> so the foreign Chinese foreign minister said, "Say uh, those uh, playing with fire um, will set yourself on fire." Um, kind of a not too subtle warning. So what's the background of this issue? How did we get into this? It goes back to the time of the Second World War when the Chinese were our allies in the war against Japan. And uh, <clears throat> Taiwan is, um, is a small island off the coast of China. It's about 90 miles from, the, uh, from Taiwan to the um, adjacent uh, Chinese province. And um, it's about 200 and some miles long, shaped kind of like a sweet potato. Um, capital is up here in Taipei, which means northern Taiwan. Um, also under the control of Taiwan are two offshore islands, Himoi and Matsu. These were big in the, in the Kennedy-Nixon debates of the 1960 election cycle. Um, some of you may have this freshly in, in memory, uh, others maybe not. Um, so um, in, uh, at the end of the uh, Second World War, the Chinese uh, Civil War broke out. Uh, but before that, uh, the island of Taiwan had been under Japanese control since uh, 1895. Uh, it, um, Taiwan was ceded to Japan after the Sino-Japanese War and became a colony uh, of Japan. Now that was not uh, uh, under the Republic of China. That was in the Ming Dynasty, in the Qing Dynasty, excuse me, the Manchu Dynasty, which lasted until 1911. So um, this island, uh, which was for 50 years under Japanese rule, hadn't had a Chinese administration ever. It had been governed by Manchus, uh, but never by a Chinese government. So in the, during the Second World War, the decision was made by the Allied powers to return this island to China after the war. So in 1945, uh, it was turned over to the nationalist Chinese government. Now, um, 1945, uh, end of the war with Japan was the outbreak of the civil war in China. And uh, the United States, which had been allied with, uh, with the nationalist government in China, wanted to make China the big power in the Western Pacific to replace Japan. That was the American plan. But um, unfortunately, the Civil War broke out in China. And uh, so there were these two uh, Chinese uh, entities, the Chinese communists, um, who were simply uh, rural, rural rebels during the war. They expanded their territory under the Japanese uh, invasion. And the nationalist Chinese government, which had governed China um, uh, since the 1920s. Uh, so the civil war breaks out and uh, the nationalists with uh, lots of arms and things from the United States um, uh, were, were uh, expected to triumph. Uh, the United States once wanted to uh, avoid a civil war and tried to get the two sides to negotiate. Here you see Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese nationalist leader, and Mao Zedong, the communist leader, making nice and uh, toasting each other. This is under uh, US uh, urging. And the United States became a, um, a not too impartial um, facilitator of talks during the during the uh, Civil War and President Truman sent George Marshall who had run the um, US um, war effort in the Second World War a man of enormous uh, ability sent him as his personal representative to the Chinese so here you see General Marshall 
Uh, on the left here, you have Zhou Enlai. Over here, Mao Zedong, a couple of generals in between there. Um, and here's General Marshall with Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Zhang, Madame Zhang, his American ed educated wife, charming woman. So the, the Civil War didn't go well for the, for the nationalists. They were, they were overthrown, to much, much to everyone's surprise. And um, here's the Civil War kind of went like this. The communists uh, occupied the northern part of China and then moved south. And once they um, took over North China, it was pretty much um, an end of game for the nationalists. And they retreated to the island uh, of Taiwan. So here's, um, here's Beijing, here's Tiananmen. And there's Chiang Kai-shek's picture on Tiananmen. Now we're used to seeing Mao Zedong's picture up there. But um, under the nationalists, uh, it was Chiang Kai-shek. And then uh, here's Mao Zedong uh, getting on top of Tiananmen in 1949 to proclaim the establishment of the People's Republic of China. So uh, this is a big moment in, in 1949. And it was expected that the communists would move across the water and take over Taiwan. Um, so um, the question was, how long, how long could the uh, could the nationalists hang on? And uh, the United States had pretty much withdrawn its support uh, for the nationalist government. So China has has two uh, two two um, governments at this time. People's Republic controlled by the communists and uh, the island of Taiwan controlled by the nationalists. This um, wouldn't have lasted very long if the, if the communists had taken over Taiwan. But in 1950, just at the key point in the, in the Civil War, um, the war broke out in Korea. And um, so President Truman um, unilaterally decided to put the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Strait. Just a word or two about Taiwan. Taiwan was a, as a semi-tropical uh, country. Uh, show tea processing going on here. Um, Japanese had ruled for fifty years, so most people spoke uh, Japanese. Many families had taken Japanese names. Here, are the Japanese soldiers retreating uh, after defeat, being going back. Um, to um, uh, uh, to Japan, and uh, this is the uh, uh, this was the Japanese uh, provincial administration building under under the colonial system, and it now is the presidential um, office building of the Republic of China. So, uh, <clears throat> in 1950, as I was saying, um, um, President Truman decided to put the um, U.S. fleet in the Taiwan Strait. And that's what you see uh, here. So this brought Taiwan under the US, um, uh, under the US uh, umbrella, if you will, in the, co in the Cold War. And um, the United States took advantage of um, the fact that, um, that, that, um, the uh, the Taiwan had a had a, na a quote national government and um, maintained that the um, Republic of China government in Taiwan was the only legal government of China. So the communist um, regime on the mainland, although it controlled most of China, was kept out of the United Nations um, for twenty years. Uh, due to U.S. pressure, the United States um, used its, its pressure, and so Taiwan had the um, seat in the United Nations and a seat on the Security Council of the United Nations. And this is part of the uh, the American effort to uh, contain communist China. This situation uh, didn't go on; couldn't go on forever. Uh, as time went by, uh, China got more and more. Um, uh, stature in international uh, life, and it became more difficult to maintain um, Taiwan's position uh, in the UN. And by the time the United States got involved in the 
in the war in Vietnam, uh, U.S. influence waned and uh, Taiwan was thrown out of the UN in 1971 and the uh, PRC was uh, uh, admitted. So these two countries, uh, these two nation states, if you will, um, Republic of China on Taiwan, People's Republic of China and Beijing, um, both claimed uh, to be the governments of uh, the legal government of China. The um, ROC um, held the UN seat until 71, then the PRC took, uh, took over. And um, the rule was that if you recognized People's Republic of China, you could not recognize um, Taiwan. So governments had to choose which one uh, to uh, ally with. And um, this um, became more and more difficult for the Taiwan regime as time went by. You can see this. Uh, here's 1949 at the time of the Civil War. That's pretty much China's um, diplomatic relations are limited pretty much to the, to the Soviet bloc. Um, 1960, um, China is making progress. Uh, 1971, this is the year in which uh, Taiwan was expelled from the United Nations and China was admitted. Since then, it's been all China. And uh, Taiwan's, these blue countries are the countries that still have um, relations with Taiwan. And, uh, and now you can see it's down, uh, it's down to less than, you know, less than a handful. So this created a problem for the United States. The United States uh, didn't recognize uh, China and China was in the United Nations. So what to do? Uh, so President um, uh, Nixon sent Henry Kissinger to, secretly uh, to, uh, to China uh, to, make uh, to make arrangements. And then, and, then Kissinger, and then Nixon himself visited China and famously met with Mao Zedong. Um, so they started dealing with each other, but uh, we, the United States didn't recognize um, uh, the People's Republic uh, because um, before it could get this uh, piece of business done, Nixon was driven from office, Watergate, all that. So it wasn't until um, 1979 uh, when things had changed quite a bit in, in China. Um, uh, Mao Zedong had died and been replaced by Deng Xiaoping. And in the United States, um, Republicans had been driven out of office and replaced by the Carter administration. So in 1979, um, oh, I got to go back and say something about the Shanghai communication. Okay, so when, uh, when Nixon and Mao talked, um, the problem was that the United States didn't want to abandon Taiwan and didn't want to uh, formally uh, embrace the People's Republic. So uh, these two guys, Henry Kissinger and Joe and Lai, two very shrewd guys, put together a statement called the Shanghai Communique. In 19, and and this, is, this is what a lot of the fighting is about. This is what they, they put in this um, communicate. The United States acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain that there is but one China and that Taiwan is part of China. Well, um, this is what the United States agreed to. The United States acknowledged that Chinese think this. The United States didn't acknowledge that there is but one China. And uh, so um, it was a way of sort of dodging, dodging the issue. Later, the Americans got careless and, and, and forgot about this wording and, and the Clinton administration, they just kind of said, yes, there is one China. We, we agree with that. We never agreed to that. Um, so um, here's a few years on when, uh, when Carter is in office and Deng Xiaoping is uh, leading China, 
then comes the United States. They formalize uh, relations and sign um, uh, the relative relevant documents. Um, and this, so this is a new new ball game. The United States has to break relations with with the government uh, on Taiwan. People in Congress don't like this, and so the Congress passes the Taiwan Relations Act, which essentially is a is a um, a unilateral statement by the Congress that's in violation, really, of American official policy, which recognizes Beijing, and says that we will um, we have an interest in uh, protecting Taiwan and getting a peaceful settlement there, and and that we will go on selling arms to Taiwan. So we're in this situation of of, of providing military support. Uh, for Taiwan's defense, and this is the issue. If if um, if Beijing comes across the strait to occupy the island, would we would the United States get involved or not? And um, this is where we're being we're supposed to be um, studiously um, unclear. Uh, but um, President Biden has made it a little too clear recently. Meanwhile, what's happened in Taiwan in the, in, the, in, the, in the years since 1949 is that a new uh, national identity has been formed here. And more than 75% of the people on Taiwan no longer uh, believe themselves to be Chinese. They are citizens of, of, um, of Taiwan. A, um, a democratic country. And uh, so will this lead to war? Uh, Graham Allison, um, smart guy from Harvard, thinks maybe, uh, maybe not. Uh, the Chinese are making increasing uh, uh, threats to Taiwan. You see Taiwan, uh, Chinese uh, uh, military aircraft uh, invading uh, Taiwan space. So this is the, that's the Taiwan issue. Stay tuned. Wow, that was fascinating. And I think Ted gave us some context for understanding some of the current tensions around Nancy Pelosi's recent visit to Taiwan. So um, his course, I'm sure, is going to have a lot more of that nuanced understanding of history and how it relates to some of the things we're seeing in the world today. Now we have our next speaker, George Dow. So welcome, George. I'm thrilled to have you here. Okay, now I'm gonna unmute myself. I'll uh, start my program. Can everybody see this uh, slide? Is a por portfolio life in your future? Can everybody see this? I can see it. Okay. If you have any problems, send us something in the chat. Sounds good. So uh, as Kate mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a portfolio life, and I'm going to uh, give you a little bit more about my background. Uh, this is a, a workshop, by the way, I did in the fall uh, for 30 folks in person. And my background uh, allowed me to have experiences with quite a few business and nonprofit leaders and, and a wide range of people, because I would, for, uh, for about 21 years, I worked for um, a outplacement firm called Wright Management. And for the last 12 years, I've had a solo practice. And I help my clients in such a way that uh, I provide assessments, uh, coaching, workshops, so that in the end, either they can have another job or uh, a new career direction. Or a third option that's come up quite a bit is a bridge towards a different version of retirement. And the version of retirement that is most popular for my clients has been a portfolio life. So the workshop was a seven part workshop about this. And I'm gonna describe both the definition of these five elements of a portfolio life, as well as <clears throat> how does one bridge towards that. The, the person that created the concept of portfolio life, it started in 1990, Charles Handy is an Irish economist. This is how he describes it. Portfolio of activities, some we do for money, some for interest, some for pleasure, some for cause. The different bits fit together to form a balanced whole greater than the parts. 1990. 
And then in the early 2000s, a gentleman named David Corbett came up with a, a book called Portfolio Life, New Path to Work, Purpose, and Passion After 50. Well, this book provided me a, a, the skeletal structure for a five-part portfolio life model that I began to utilize back in that period of the early 2000s, because many of the clients that came my way were saying, I don't want another leadership job, I want a new life. I want a different version of retirement. I'm not too satisfied with just the, the form of retirement that, that leans more towards pleasure and leisure and that doesn't do it for me. So what they came up with in this group called uh, New Directions out of Boston is over a 10 year period, analyzing what were business and nonprofit leaders most attractive to and uh, it, it came up to being a portfolio life of these five elements I'll describe in a moment. But first, I think I wanna give you my philosophy of aging. Uh, and here it is. I think the life stages we occupy uh, about every 25 years or so include first broad mastery. You know, The first part of our lives are about reading, writing, arithmetic, learning, social skills, uh, developmental skills. We have a broad sense, I guess maybe a liberal arts mindset of learn, a wide range of things, and then eventually narrow it down. Narrow it down to your major, narrow it down to achievement, perhaps it's professional achievement, personal achievement with family, but really uh, focus in those next 25 years in particular on achievement, professional and family achievement. Then at a certain point, somewhere between 50 and 75, we look towards broader possibilities, broader possibilities for personal, professional, community, involvement. This could be something in our 50s, 60s, or 70s that we start to broaden out our lives. And somewhere after 75, typically, uh, is a two-part focus of health and legacy. Health, I'd say, is a bit of a gatekeeper that determines whether or not we continue broader possibilities after age 75. And legacy is when, um, when we have a scorecard for our life. How did we do? So those tend to be the four elements. And it looks for per periods, it looks kind of like a clock, but I think the reality is more like an hourglass. So if you look at these same four stages of life and you look at it as, as you would an hourglass, the top part is broad mastery. We move towards a, a tightening focus of achievement. And then most people in the I program are looking at these broader possibilities, not just to 75, but to 80, 90, beyond. But what determines how long we stay in these broader possibilities, uh, quite a bit of it is health. And then ultimately when the sands come to a stopping point, it's about legacy. So that's my sense of life stages, my philosophy, if you will. And I wanna walk you through now uh, some things about um, a, a blog series that I put together a couple of years ago, I realized and you see the retirement reimagined in the middle of, the, of the, the line on top, I thought I should put together the top 10 blogs I've, I've done for retirement reimagined as a portfolio life. It's a drop down menu and it's called Retirement Reimagined Guide. And you can open it up uh, at georgedow.com, my website. And you'll see that the first uh, blog is about life and work after 60, broader possibilities ahead. This first blog describes uh, the portfolio life and different aspects of it. It's kind of an introductory blog. And then it starts to move through five blogs that are either case studies or descriptions of each of the five portfolio life elements. The first being working in the form you want. In fact, in, uh, you, you might see in the catalog on Thursdays in the fall, I'm gonna teach a two-part series on this topic of working in the form you want. And what I used in this blog is a case study from my father and my father-in-law. And my father-in-law retired at age 65, got bored, and started going back to the, the banks he used to occupy. He was a sales rep for Deluxe Corporation for 60, I'm sorry, for 30, 38 years. And at age 65, he retired. After getting bored, after about six months, he started to wander back to the banks and the credit unions. And he said, um, how's Deluxe treating you? And he said, well, just fine. Uh, how's the competition? And they described a small two-person operation. And uh, he said, well, how good are they? Well, they're good products. Uh, how's the pricing? Really good pricing. How about the sales rep? And they said, well, 
he's no George Tao. My dad has the same name as I do. And so one thing led to another, and my father talked to the man that ran the little bank form company, and it turned out that for the next 15 years, uh, he became a sales rep again, but on his terms. Uh, he'd work one day a week or five days a week or take five weeks off, and they said, that's fine. You can do that. So my dad led a portfolio life starting at age 65. My father-in-law, Jack Hill, ended up at age 57 being told he was going to be let go because there was a downturn in the business. He was the vice president of research and development for Ramsey Technology. And he had to act really quickly and say, how about instead of letting me go, uh, I'll work half time, pay me half the wages. And I will go from being a vice president to being an engineer again and solve your toughest problems, your most difficult engineering problems. And they agreed. And so from age 57 to 67, he ended up with um, really a portfolio life, working half the time and the rest of his time spent with various other ways of learning and giving back and healthy activities and leisure. So take a look at that blog. Uh, it's the second one in my series of, of, uh, of 10. And then take a look at learning and self-development. You'll recognize that it shows, um, it shows that Ali is featured in the middle of it because uh, a woman from church agreed to help me with this blog. And she introduced me to the Ali program about four years before I myself retired or moved into a portfolio life. So you'll see a lot of description of Ali, the programs, the University of Minnesota taking classes. I had linked to an article from the Star Tribune. You'll see that's a helpful way to look at um, what could you do uh, in, in terms of learning and development. Giving back, uh, one of the things about my background is at age 50, I started playing hockey again. And one of my hockey buddies uh, uh, is now 70, I'm 67. And, and I asked him to help with this blog where he talked about how did he vet opportunities for volunteering for himself um, in, in his years after he left um, his, his bank organization. And he was a, a chief information officer. And now he uh, has a nice portfolio life with a lot of giving, volunteering as part of his, his work. Healthy Living, this is where I invited my wife, Bonnie, to do the blog on Healthy Living. And Healthy Living, I define as mental, physical, spiritual, financial, and relationship health. And Bonnie wrote a great blog, uh, which is the fifth in my series. And she came to the workshop, uh, did a whole 90-minute session on health uh, at, at the workshop I did last fall for Ollie. So take a look at that blog if you'd like to learn more about health from a retired family, family practice physician. The final uh, in the series of Portfolio Lives, it's enjoying personal pursuits and leisure. One of the things I realized is that I should spend a good amount of time talking about leisure and, and seeking pleasure, but recognizing that a portfolio life in one form, a form I'd, I'd advocate for myself would be 20% in each of these five categories used to be that 80% would be in this category of personal pursuits and leisure and 20% in the rest. But what I decided to do is take from a book called um, What Colors Your Parachute in Retirement by Richard Bowles, uh, the author of What Colors Your Parachute for about 42 years. And he had a segment uh, of his book, What Colors Your Parachute in Retirement, that was about these three elements that I, I'm, I'm gonna reference, about pleasure, engagement, and purpose. And his argument is that it's almost like a Venn diagram, where if you have pleasure, those things you do that are just, just for fun, you can buy them, doesn't last that long, but it's just pleasure. But what we lose a lot of times when we leave work is engagement, where we get into a state of, of a flow of, of mental and emotional engagement, where we time passes quickly where our, our spirit, our mind is fully engaged. That's called engagement or flow. The third element is about what we do for other people, purpose. And, and in his book, What Calls Your Parachute for Retirement, Bridges says, or I'm sorry, uh, Bull says, you know, we need to be looking at how we're making a difference for people and causes outside of ourselves. Purpose is a huge part of what brings satisfaction uh, to life. So in this blog, I talk about the three parts, pleasure, enjoying personal pursuits and leisure, and engagement and purpose. So it's just a cautionary 
uh, blog that talks about maybe having all three of those factors in place. So those are the five elements of a portfolio life as I define them and as I guide my clients through them and do my workshops about those, those five elements. Now the question becomes, how do you get from here to there? And a big part of what I like to do is to talk about bridging from where you're at. Even if you're in five years, 10 years into retirement, we had one person in our workshop that was I think 80 some years old, a couple of people in their 80s and and uh, one had written a book about retirement. And I, and I said, you know, my bias is towards self-assessment and moving into action, but people need to know what are the steps, what are the foundational pieces that when added together could be a bridge to walk over towards portfolio life. And so what, what I did is to borrow from um, a model I learned at the Shannon Institute, uh, Ronnie Brooks taught me this, and that is that you lay down mattresses to get from here to there, these are the eight mattresses you lay down to get across the chasm because you can't just jump without potential bodily harm. Uh, so here's what it looks like. I've just been describing to you, learning about creating a portfolio. Life. Go to the very bottom of this uh, chasm and you see learning about creating a portfolio. Life. In, in that case, I think I'd recommend mostly uh, the 10 blog series in my georgedow.com um, website, but also Portfolio Life by David Corbett and thinking about how is it that, what is this portfolio life and how can one move towards it? The second self-assessment, uh, and then the third uh, up shifting connection, crafting experiments, that can be found in the book, Working Identity, that I'm gonna share with you in just a moment. But you see above the first three foundational are the five portfolio life elements, working the form you want, learning and self-development, giving back healthy living and personal pursuits and leisure, what I've just described to you. But the self-assessment means, so what direction might I follow that aligns with my skills, my interests, my values, and what I, who I am? But this third element is to be experiential, to be crafting experiments, try things on a small scale before you move forward and shifting connections to people who are trying to help you, who are good role models, who help you move forward. So I'm going to cover that now with a little bit more detail. Uh, the assessment part is living your life and moving towards your work in after 60 by creating your future guided by your past. This is the seventh blog in my series, and it's the same assessments I do with my clients. So it's there for you, four exercises. And the first one is about looking backwards, uh, trying to understand your, your past. And these are my favorite um, quotes about that. Uh, life is a forward, but understood backwards. I've quoted that many times. You have to look backwards to understand yourself. Uh, Steve Jobs said, you can't connect the dots moving forward. This next one I got from Kate uh, Schaefer's, uh, if a glimpse of the future is possible, it must come from an intimacy with the present um, created by, by great works of the past. I, you know what? Am I, when you have, when I have all these things that blocks my view of some of my words, so <laughs> I can't see present clarified by the great works of the past. I think that's it, Robert Kaplan, the journalist. And the last one, give me a child until he is seven and I will show you the man, Aristotle provided that. And so much of who we are has already been defined historically. And if you look at this, um, this series of documentaries, seven up and 56 up, I shared this with my class last fall, and Seven Up was is a series done in, start with kids that were born in 1954, uh, both wealthy and poor kids in London, and it followed them for, you know, for the from age seven to age 56, and each year it reveals what uh, the acorn. <laughs> is like moving into its uh, its oak tree. And it shows how much of what we bring to life uh, is perpetuated year in, year out. And maybe it was the Hawthorne effect. These people, these young people uh, from wealthy and from poor backgrounds, about 40 of them, um, they show you every seven years how they've preserved what's inside of them and acted it out. And um, it's amazing how this uh, series works out. I think you can get it from Amazon. Uh, prime. So this is this is about moving forward um, and taking action. And this book called Working Identity by Hermania Ibarra, Working Identity, Hermania Ibarra, it's covered up a little bit in my screen, um, 
she came up with this book in the early 2000s, and it was a game changer for my industry of career coaching. It says, don't be just caught up in analysis paralysis, looking too much just at your past for, for guidance and planning and planning and planning. Be bold and take action. Trust your instincts. Try small experiments before you make a bigger commitment. And shift connections to people that are, are doing a really good job at, at this thing called retirement or this thing called a portfolio life and let them guide you. And then after a period of experimentation and shifting connections, see what makes sense. A great book that's really liberated a lot of my clients. And said, they said, you know, my world just got bigger. My ideas got broader. Uh, it, was, it was emboldening me to try new things and to reach out to people for guidance. And the first part, craft experiments, this is on the right-hand side of my, um, my line on, on the, the homepage. It's uh, archives of my blogs. And crafting experiments, again, means trying out things on a small scale before you make a bigger commitment. In November 13, uh, in my blog archives, I explain that in greater detail. And then December 13th, on, in my blog archives, I talk about shifting connections and the strength of weak ties. It's just about how how we can gain so much by talking to others and getting their ideas. The ninth blog in my series is about shifting connections and networking in retirement. I think you'll appreciate that blog about uh, 10 reasons um, why networking is important in retirement and 10 steps on how to do it. So again, I refer you back to my blog series. And finally, I wanna walk you through the, <clears throat> the um, Portfolio Life workshop I did last fall. I'll probably do it again, maybe in a year after um, after do a couple more. I think I'll do one. I know I'm going to do one in the fall on uh, working the form you want. And then in the spring, I might do one on Frank Lloyd Wright. So the, the beauty of Ollie is that you can, you don't have to just stay with your one subject matter area. I think I, think I might do an architectural uh, presentation if it's approved on Frank Lloyd Wright. But I, I digress. So a, a portfolio life workshop, the way I put it together, started with introductions where I think people in a workshop should get to know each other. And so introducing yourself, um, take, I take about 15 minutes, 30 people in the class, half a minute, 45 seconds each, talking about your background, why you're here, uh, and, and uh, what you did before, what you're thinking about. Portfolio life definitions, as I've done with you, and homework. I, I, I heard mentioned that we don't have homework in Ollie, but yes, we sometimes do. This is a developmental uh, class, which means I like to have about 20 minutes of lecture uh, presentation on the subject matter first, and then about 20 minutes of small groups of four talking about, in, in many cases in this one, how you could be a resource to the group, what you struggle with, and um, how you would like to get ideas from the small group. So we might go back again to a uh, discussion or more presentation, and then another, another breakout group of four people. You can, anybody that's on this, on this uh, webinar that has attended that workshop knows that we go between presentation, small group discussion, large group discussion or more presentation, and then breaking often back into another reason, another discussion in a small group. Because I think shifting connections is about taking advantage of how much wisdom is in an Ali class. Any Ali class has great wisdom. And why not talk to each other? Uh, shift connections to people that are, that are doing some amazing things that you might want to learn about. I gave you the homework. You know, the first, uh, that, that one session that was about, the one um, uh, blog that's about uh, creating your future guided by your past, that's uh, covered as the homework. And then in the second session, talk about your history audit. What was above the line, below the line in three aspects, three stages of your life, and what does it mean? Looking at the ups and downs and talk about in the past, pleasure, engagement, and purpose, how it's occupied your life. And session three is a vision, looking forward. It's your 75th birthday or add five years if you're 75 or 80, add five years. Um, have everybody close their eyes and imagine what would they like to hear on their 75th birthday? What would people be thanking them for in round one, personally, professionally, and in the community? What are people thanking you for in round one? In round two, where's the gap between where you're at today and where you'd like to be personally, professionally, and within the community? on your 75th or 80th or 90th birthday. Um, 
how are you on, in alignment and where's the gap and how you might fill that gap and how to build a portfolio life in, in this session. Talk about paid and volunteer work in the fourth session. In the fifth, learning and leisure. Again, many of the breakouts are about how, are you, how can you be a resource to your small group? Where do you struggle? And how could the group help you with these areas in, in session four and session five? And particularly, these are four aspects of the portfolio life. Session six is health, including mind, body, spirit, financial relationships. And again, um, this was my wife, Bonnie, who came as a guest speaker to talk to the group we covered because health is so important. We took a whole 90 minute session on health, both presentation and small group discussions. And then finally, putting it all together and sustainable change strategies. As I see my 20 minutes has, have now expired. This is uh, the seven sessions that I did last fall. I'll do it in probably another year. I'll do it again. Uh, it went really well. And um, I was grateful to have a great group of 30. Some of you are probably on this call. And I look forward to, to more sessions on retirement called a portfolio life in the future. That's it. Thank you. George, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, as you can see from George's approach to this, as well as just some of the content, that George's session is more hands-on and reflective and interactive. So we do have these kinds of courses. And George, you reminded me as you talked about teaching for Ali that um, we do have instructors that come from our community as well as um, are not part of our community. Sometimes they come with a specific expertise, but sometimes they teach a class because they want to learn about something and they have a passion. And so we welcome um, people proposals from people who are interested in teaching across the gamut. Um, people can start small and informally with teaching for us um, with just even doing a single session, or you can also just dive in with both feet and teach a seven session series. So we're open to all of those things. And George, I also do want to say, um, you know, what you talked about really resonated with me when we think about our life stages, uh, reminded me of that quote by Carl Jung, and you know, I won't get it exactly, but just something along the lines of we can't live the afternoon of our lives based on um, the morning's program. And so I think recognizing that after 50, there's some specific things that are really important for us to pay attention to. And I just really did love that looking at broader possibilities as being one of those stages, as well as health and legacy. And I think those are really important to think about in a purposeful way. So thank you so much, George. That was terrific. Um, and now I would like to welcome Wu to join us. And um, Wu has a wonderful presentation for us. So Wu, go ahead and unmute yourself and welcome. Thank you, Kate. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be here to share my presentation. The title of my presentation is Applying Music Therapy in Telehealth. I thought I would divide this presentation to two different parts. One is tell you about my PhD research, especially my dissertation research. The other part is I think research is not just do a study, publish a paper, or create a project, put it on the shelf. I think the purpose of research is really to apply to real life, to make the real change. So the second half of my presentation today will share with you how I put my research data into practice. To start us off, why am I interested in study applying music therapy in telehealth? Just a second. Let me go back. So the rationale comes with a lot of rural area, especially for children with disabilities. They have very low accessibility for therapy or intervention that you need. And 2020, we all know what happened, COVID-19. At that time, everything shut down. A lot of children who are receiving their intervention at school or community, they couldn't go anymore. Everybody has to stay online. A lot of places didn't have that in place. They couldn't just transition to online session right away. So a lot of children lost their opportunity to receive intervention. Another reason is telehealth hasn't been studied in the field of music therapy that much. So I thought that would be interesting to take a look at that. As Kate mentioned earlier, I work at McPhail Center for Music. 
we have a different locations. One of them is in Austin, Minnesota. It's far away from the other locations in the metro area. For five or six years, Snackfield has been wanting to start a music therapy program down there. However, nobody wants to travel there. So this is an opportunity to bring telehealth or telemusic therapy to our Austin, Minnesota location. So why study autism? First of all, by definition in the DSM-5, autism has two distinctive deficit. One is social communication, the other is behavior. And the research has shown that children with autism actually respond to music quite well. And there are some network overlaps between music and non-music skills. For example, research has shown that there are some preserved skills for people with autism. For example, they are always good at pitch and timbre processing. You may notice that sometimes children with autism, they have a perfect pitch. You play some notes on the piano, they can tell you what they are. They have a good melodic memory. They listen to a song once or twice. They remember after a long time, or they can just sing it back to you. They also have a good rhythmic synchronization. You start to play a beat on the drum or on the countertop. They can copy you and do quite well. Another research show that they, although they couldn't really identify emotions through social context, a lot of times you may heard they couldn't really read your face, but they can identify the emotions in music. And there are some shared networks like a broken area, our left side of brain, it's in charge of our language and communication. And also frontal temporal area, those are the area music has access to. Music has access to the whole brain, but this two area we can use for our intervention as music therapists. By definition, music therapy is really working on attention, social behavior, speech language, emotion, motor, and etc. different skills and abilities. Telehealth. We all are familiar with telehealth by now, and there are several benefits about it. First of all, research has shown that there is no significant differences between in-person and telehealth interventions. It also improves accessibility, reduce travel time, and shrink the wait list for people who are waiting to be seen. Those are the field that have already established their telehealth practice. But music therapy is still on its beginning of discovery and show evidence of its efficacy of telemusic therapy. A big cost effectiveness is the benefit of telehealth. Consider in-person and a virtual visit. You can cut down the travel time. You don't have to pay for transportation. A lot of people who have disabilities, they couldn't drive themselves. They have to take the metro transition. People who live in the rural area, they just have a few options. Not a lot of opportunity are there. Um, so telehealth really provide the services that do not exist locally. So to define telemusic therapy, it is to use the real-time video conferencing platforms to provide music therapy services. There are a few researchers have done previously regarding telemusic therapy. They are mostly case study or very shallow level of initiative primary study. So the first study is on a young man who has Oxford, Asperger, excuse me, Asperger syndrome. It's part of autism. And this was done compared in person and online. So this young man was doing songwriting intervention. At the beginning, he was doing that with a the therapist one-to-one -one in person. And then they moved to different two different rooms and still talk with each other online. And the results show that this young man was able to make more eye contact and have more conversation with the therapist online. 
when they were in person, face to face, he had a harder time to look her in the eyes or have more conversation. And the results show that when he was moved to the other room and look at the therapist on the screen, he was able to comfortably looking at her and uh, communicate and also communicate his disagreement regarding how to write the lyrics. I found that was interesting, be able to express his thought easily. And this is a research done at the university, have a partnership with the child soldiers in Uganda. Those people who experienced PTSD, anxiety, flashback. So they were partnering with the student group to do some instrument playing drum circle. And the results show that they experienced reduced symptom of PTSD after the session. And there's another study in Australia on children with hearing loss. Those people live in the rural area, don't have access to interventions, and they were able to receive telemusic therapy. And this research was profound in a way that the child caregiver received so much more support and felt that they were able to gain tools and skills to work with our children through telemedicine therapy services. To talk about my dissertation research, this is an overall of my method. I was using a mixed method study, which contains both qualitative study and quantitative study. Qualitative study is mainly use evidence of interview and people's experience. And quantitative study is really using the data-driven method to do statistic analysis to show effectiveness. For the left side, the proper side, you can see that is the qualitative study. I used the online interview with parents to understand their situation, their experience of having their children with disability. And I recorded the session, also transcribed it, did thematical analysis, and those will be used for inform the intervention design for my RCT, randomized controlled trial. So for my quantitative study, the randomized controlled trial, I enrolled 30 children with autism aged between eight and 17, randomized them to two different groups. One group will start intervention first, the other group will wait for the first eight weeks while the first group is going through their session and then I will cross over. So everybody received intervention just at different time. After statistical and thematical analysis, I will drive the quantitative and quantitative results out as the result of the study. So the online interview asked a few questions. What are the children's response to music? Do they have a formal experiences of music therapy? Do they have IEP, the individualized educational plan? Do they, do they have online services? How about do they do school online? What was that like? What are some goals the children have for their session? What are some goals the parents have for their children? How do the parents know the goal are reached? And uh, the last question is, what do parents wish their community would provide for them? And for the quantitative part, as I mentioned a little bit, I enrolled 30 children and then I did a baseline assessment to have the parents complete standardized tools based on the questionnaire. And then I randomized them into two different groups. Treatment group will start intervention right away. Control group will wait for the first eight weeks. And then both groups will go through the, the midpoint assessment and then crossover. So the first people in the control group will now go to the treatment group. And the first people in the treatment group will go to the control group to wait now. After that eight weeks, everybody will go through the final assessment again. This is what is the setting like. On the left side, you can see this is where I was doing my session. My session is controlled in the same room every single session. I have a cart with a computer on it. We call it Skype cart at McPhail. We can move it all over to have a camera face me. There's a microphone 
and uh, I can hear and talk to my clients. They can see me, I can see them, and I have access to all the instruments I need. And this is what they look like on the other end from the client or participants. They can see me on the screen. They can do things accordingly. For the measurement, I use three different measurements. For social communication and behavior, I used developmental behavior checklist two and go attainment scaling. For attention and focus, I used the promise cognitive function and go attainment scaling to assess where they are at. That was my dissertation research, mainly focused on telehealth. This part I would like to share with you more about my PhD research and how I used the research result to drive real life situation change. So to put research funding into practice, first I want to show a little bit of research foundation. Back in 2019, I went back home to do a focus group study. By the way, I'm from China. I picked two different rehabilitation centers in mainland China. One is in the East Coast, the other is in the West Coast. As you may know, China is a huge country. From East to West, they vary a bit. E economically, traditionally, culturally, and religiously. So I picked these two just because they are distinctly different. And I enrolled 50 parents in each rehab center who they have children receive intervention there. I basically ask this one question. What is your experience having a child with disability? After I did my interview, my focus group, and analyzed all the results, five things emerged. They are being different, feeling vulnerable, being resilient, valuing kindness and support, and accepting disability. Although these two different regions vary uh, quite a bit, they have a different culture, different economic, different traditions. However, what I found is more similarity than differences. And reflect to my dissertation research by interviewing parents who are in the US, I realized, huh, that sounds familiar. So that made me realize having a child with disability is more like a universal experience, despite the language difference, cultural difference, economic differences. Therefore, I used the data-driven result to build a project called Light in a Well. So what is Light in a Well? It is a multi-sensory event, weaving together symphony movements with real life stories. The purpose is to honor people with disabilities and their families by telling their true stories and invite everybody come into a conversation of hope. In this project, people with disabilities were invited to be on stage under the spotlight to share their own stories and perform alongside with professional musicians. After the first show we did at McPhail Center for Music last October, many audience came to us with tears in their eyes, said they came expected to be entertained, but left being educated because they got to see what life is like with disability. Here, please allow me to introduce the four featured individuals in this project, Life in the Well. Present the Native American. She's from the Lakota tribe in South Dakota. When she was young, she was sick and uh, had a brain tumor. Ever since, she went through chemotherapy and had a traumatic brain injury. Eventually, she was adopted by her mom now who poured love to her life, and now she's thriving. James is a true pianist who happened to have autism. Here, you will see how he used music to express himself, to have fun, to become a true pianist, even with the obstacles. 
Pharaoh was born with a genetic condition called partial trisomy 13. She went through so many different surgeries. However, when doctor predicted this baby only supposed to live to one year old, she turned 26 year old on the day of Light in the Wild production. Nathan is a showman. He was born with Down syndrome during the time when Down syndrome wasn't well known. Nathan now is a writer, a speaker, a drummer, and a dancer. And through this, this project, we learned a lot from both sides, the audience side and the participant side. Right now, please allow me to share some of the results with you. I made a, a small video with our first show pictures, music, and also the audience response in one video. Here it goes. reflection from our participant, Nathan. As I said, he's a showman, he's still the show. You can see what of his experience is being part of Lighting the Well. I really love music, like from an orchestra to um, some music. In my uh, Night of the Well, it's fantastic. I did a performance with a drumming by Africa style, and then I did an African style dance with a, a roha a little bit with that. And then I did a solo with all bad jazz. And next is Nathan's father's experience as a participant, but also as a parent in the show. 
the whole situation from the uh, beginning of practices, from our first meeting with the composer and telling the stories, uh, it went way beyond what I anticipated the whole process was going to be. And of course, because of the COVID time, everything got stretched out much longer. But I believe that that may in the long run have been a very positive thing because we uh, had more time to process each of the things that was going to take place. So uh, for me, it was a, 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 a kind of an overwhelming experience because I'm always looking at having been in music, uh, looking at what that process is and what it's doing for the individual in the long run. And so everything fit together uh, by the time we got to the concert. I think it, from my experience uh, since the concert and speaking to a lot of different people, there is interest out there uh, for people to see this and the, uh, the amazing things that music will do, but I believe it could also serve to uh, uh, enlighten folks uh, about uh, people with disabilities and what family life uh, is, is like. Uh, I think that uh, that showed up very clearly in the four different families uh, that uh, each one of us uh, has a different experience to go through and uh, much of our lives almost become unpredictable uh, at times. So, and I believe when people are educated uh, with which Light in the Well was going to do a fantastic job mm -hmm. that it is going to help change lives. Lives not only for the person with disabilities but the lives of the people who learn about people with disabilities and the great things they have to offer. And uh, lastly, I want to show that Lion in the Well also we involve people with disabilities. A lot of times it's unpredictable, especially you're doing a live show. At the end of our show, after the last note, everybody in the audience stood up and started clapping for us. Our youngest participant, Beth, wasn't ready for the show to be end. So she started to cry and scream. At that time, I quickly walked to the microphone, start to sing a song we had been working on in our session to help her to recognize her own emotion and cope with those. And you can see after years of hard work, the therapy really shows results on the stage. Within the first four lines of the song, she changed from screaming, crying to completely calm down. Let me show you this testimony of therapy. <laughs> about research and the practice, you can really fit both parties in and really show growth of the people we serve. Lastly, I thought to finish our, uh, finish my presentation with a song we sing in Light in the Well called the Song of Acceptance. We couldn't hear your voice, so please feel free to join me sing the song together. We 
much, Wu. That was wonderful. And thank you for introducing us to those amazing musicians. Um, I know we're at the end of our time. And I just want to say a big thank you to our presenters today, as well as our staff who provided behind the scenes support, in particular, Grayson, Carmi, and Andy. Um, you did a terrific job here. And I'd also like to just refer you to our website, ali.umn.edu. You can see our course offerings, our guide. You can download that. You can also just find out more about joining. Um, our membership fee is $300 for a full year membership. It's all inclusive. You can read more about that on the website, but I just do want to say we have scholarships. So if that's a barrier, please don't let it be a barrier. Just reach out to us. Thank you so much. I'm just honored to have you here today, and we are thrilled to have had this time together. And please visit our website or reach out to us. We will send this recording to you and a thank you. So if you have any questions, just get back to us. Thank you so much and bye.